Hi, everybody. Welcome to Shasai Podcast, conversations between scholars from around the world who study childhood, youth, and related institutions historically. As an official production of the Society for the History of Children and Youth, you can subscribe to these shows through iTunes or Google Play. Written and visual materials associated with each episode are available at our website, shcy.org. Enjoy. So, hello, everybody. I am Professor Brian Rouleau. Um, I teach... Uh, I teach courses on the history of childhood and the family down at Texas A&M University. And uh, here with me today is uh, Betsy Wood, who teaches at Bard Early College in Newark, New Jersey. And uh, Betsy is the author of Upon the Altar of Work, Child Labor and the Rise of a New American Sectionalism, uh, which came out in 2020 with the University of Illinois Press. Um, Betsy, thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you so much uh, for speaking with me today about my book. I'm really excited um, to talk with you. Yeah, well, I too am excited. And just uh, for everyone out there um, on the internet, uh, this is the moment of the interview where I give a sort of a disclosure uh, sort of <laughs> statement, a uh, full disclosure. I absolutely loved this book. Um, I actually reviewed it for a, for the publication Labor, um, and uh, as you might see, were you to read the review, um, I am. I was just absolutely and utterly enthusiastic about um, essentially the entire book. So I'm afraid I can't be a terribly uh, objective interviewer to the extent that uh, mostly I want to sing the book's praises. Uh, but uh, just to go ahead and get us started. Um, could you sort of give, uh, for, for the listeners out there, could you sort of give a, a, a brief kind of, I guess we call them the elevator, the elevator pitch, the sort of overview of the book, sort of what, what, it, what it does, what it argues? Um, yeah, why don't we start there? Okay, yeah, so upon the altar of work, um, you know, my elevator pitch is that this is the first book to... Um, show how debates about child labor in America were influenced by the anti-slavery movement um, and the conflict over slavery itself and broke down along sectional lines between the North and the South. So there's been a lot written on child labor reform, the movement to end child labor, but typically it's been told as a story of progress, like one where, you know, child labor existed a long time ago, it was really bad, but thankfully reformers came along and they fought to change it. They had a movement to change it and they were able to abolish it. Um, and, you know, this book tries to complicate that narrative of progress by showing how it was really um, a decades long battle, lasted for a long time. And not only was there a movement that developed to end child labor that grew out of initially the um, anti slavery. Um, movement, um, but there was also a counter movement that developed after the Civil War that was just as organized, just as well funded as the movement to end child labor. They wanted to oppose um, ending child labor and oppose what the reformers wanted. And most people, I think, don't know that, that there was a, an opposition movement that developed and it broke down largely along North-South lines, the North being the movement to abolish um, child labor are based in the North um, and uh, Northern led um, and really part of the progressive um, era at its height. The counter movement began in the South and was led by um, Southern manufacturers that funded it and helped to organize it. And they also had successes and it's more of a mixed legacy and not just one of a victory. And it really, to me, it really is the the sectionalism dimension that made your book so fresh, so eye opening um, to me. I mean, I was more sort of generally familiar with the classic or sort of textbook yeah. account of the fight to end child labor in the United States, and that story really isn't ordinarily told along sectional lines per se. And indeed, sort of sectionalism is 
a sort of a key term that student or students are asked to know something about in their early American history courses, in their sort of first half of the US survey courses, but it's something that tends to sort of fade away um, in the, at least in our sort of typical sort yes. of rendering, I guess, of the postbellum era. And what you seem to be arguing is, uh, exactly that um, sectionalism remains just as relevant and just as pertinent in sort of organizing the major political conflicts print and in this case principally that uh, over child labor in the aftermath of the Civil War. Um, so mm -hmm. can can you just can you tell us a little bit about uh, going back to the beginning or back to basics? Yeah. I mean where yeah. where where did the where did the idea for the book um, emerge or or where where, where did your journey start? Um, can you talk a little bit about that? Uh, yeah, so, you know, I was at the University of Chicago in the early aughts, and at that time, it was Thomas Holt, um, Julie Seville, Amy Drew Stanley, and many others, um, and they were doing exciting things around the question of emancipation and the meaning of freedom and looking at post-emancipation societies and asking, you know, big questions like my advisor, um, Thomas Hold, had just edited, like at the time that I um, came to the University of Chicago, he had just edited, co-edited a volume called um, Beyond Slavery um, with um, Rebecca Scott and Frederick Cooper. And that was one of the first volumes to um, kind of compare post-emancipation societies. So a lot of historians had done comparative slavery and looking at you know, different um, societies that had been structured around the institution of slavery and how they compared, but nobody had really done that with post-emancipation um, societies. And I just thought that that was so interesting, like, uh, and, a, and a framework for thinking about the United States of America as a post-emancipation society. Mm -hmm. Like, what does it mean that this had been, um, you know, a conflict in American history um, literally a war fought over the institution of slavery. And it occurred to me and to you know the scholars that I was working with at the time that there were a lot more questions that should be asked about the consequences of that, um, you know, in a broad sense, in, a, um, unexpe in unexpected ways, like how did capitalism in America develop perhaps differently or the labor movement or, you know, political disagreements in America because of this conflict um, over slavery and its aftermath and the debates that came out of it. And in the United States, it was a civil war. So surely there's a legacy of that somewhere that is still with us. And I think we all know, yes, there is, but surprisingly, there had not been a lot written about it. As you said in your introduction, um, you know, there are a lot of assumptions about reconciliation um, after um, after the Civil War, and there's more scholarship, um, at least, you know, at the time that I was writing this book, a lot of scholarship that emphasized um, how the North and the South, um, you know, came together in the late 19th century, uh, kind of a white sectional reconciliation that happened. Um, I looked into scholarship on capitalism, the rise of consumer capitalism in the late 19th century, and most of that scholarship was saying there was a break. Uh, between the 19th century where you had, you know, um, the Civil War and then you had industrial forms of capitalism um, in the North, but that consumer capitalism was was really something new. Um, and so they weren't, you know, it was, it, it bothered me. It was like dissatisfying mm -hmm. that there wasn't a connection being made. And so um, I, I wanted to be part of that. And I wanted to, to find a way to get at that. And Julie Seville at the University of Chicago, <laughs> um, I remember being in her office and she said to me, you should look at the legacy of anti-slavery because that would be one way, you know, to trace, um, you know, what, what happened to the vision, the specific vision of anti-slavery reformers. Um, if you could find, a, you know, a legacy, you know, of that movement. A lot of people have said that it just, that it just died, it broke up. Mm -hmm. You know, if you could find a way to get at that, then maybe you could trace it all the way into the 20th century. And 
that's what happened. <laughs> so, and it, I didn't expect it. I did not know it would be child labor, but um, it came from studying um, abolitionism and looking into anti-slavery sources that led me to the issue of child labor. And I was just thrilled when I realized that there was a direct connection and I knew that child labor had become a big issue in the industrial um, period. And I wondered if anybody had looked at it from that perspective and nobody had. So um, it was an exciting journey. That is so fantastic. And I love, I just love stories like this. These projects that evolve out of casual conversation, um, but but suddenly the, you know, the sort of the, the light bulb atop the head goes off. Um, and one thing leads to another, and soon enough, uh, you've got a book <laughs> in yeah. your hands. Um, but one question that always comes to my mind uh, when I think a little bit about how projects begin then um, is to consider as well how they evolve over right. time. So I am kind of curious to hear from you. Uh, so the project begins sort of uh, innocently enough, uh, sort of it, 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 it sort of gestates, uh, you know, based on a conversation, you know, you, you had with some advisors and colleagues in graduate school. Right. Um, but as you step into the archives um, yeah. and as you devote years to the investigation of this issue, um, were there things that you expected to find but didn't? Were there assumptions that you'd made that needed to be ultimately revised by the time you end up finishing the project? I mean, so so how, how did your thinking, how did, how did these ideas, how did your approach to the subject change um, once you got into the archives and, and dug into the evidence itself? What, yeah. what were you most surprised by? Um, there were so many things that along the way that, you know, in some ways it felt like a book that wanted to be written. And I am not making mm. this up. It seemed like, you know, there is a story there that once I started finding it, and I, again, I, I, I didn't really know about the counter movement. I, I didn't, you know, to um, oppose uh, ending child labor. I, I did not know that there would be kind of a north-south conflict that would continue. I knew there would be interesting questions about kind of the meaning of freedom, um, especially after the Civil War. So I think the way I started was more along the lines of, you know, how can I trace um, the different debates about the meaning of freedom? And, you know, in a capitalist society and, you know, are there ways in which um, I'm going to, you know, maybe contribute to um, scholarship on the rise of consumer capitalism. And mm -hmm. I, I was more thinking about consumer capitalism at the time. That narrative is still there a little bit. You can you can find it. It's there. I, I was influenced by Jackson Lears, um, who wrote about anti-modernist movements and no place of grace. You know, I was still thinking about um, the rise of consumer capitalism, but what I found that happened is that that original agenda, I guess, research agenda sort of got, um, you know, a little bit jettisoned um, as I came across these characters that were in um, the movement and the counter movement. Um, I, I guess I was surprised by, um, so many things, the way that the movement to end child labor itself was launched, um, that happened um, surprisingly enough in the South um, after the Civil War. Um, it was part of the rise of industry in the New South and the rise of textile mills, but specifically it was that textile mills were, you know, exploiting poor white children um, almost exclusively, and this became a concern for Southern white reformers because they were white children, um, and that was how the issue was launched on a national stage. Um, and so for me, this was, um, you know, an important, I mean, there had been, uh, I, I can't take credit for being the first person to, <laughs> you know, to discover that, um, but um but it was a it was a turning point, you know, for me um, to think about 
um, how this issue was opening on to all kinds of questions in American history. I didn't expect I would be writing about, you know, the Spanish-American War um, in the late 19th century as an important context for understanding why child labor became a national problem um, in the age of American imperialism when, you know, the strength of the white race um, and kind of the these white supremacist ideals that were both in the in the South and in the North, um, you know, became a rallying point for saving the poor white child from racial deterioration in factories so that they could be strong enough and robust enough to become the, you know, imperial um, uh, do dominators, uh, I guess, right, of, right. of the world. And so, um, you know, there were there were moments like that that um, I, I decided I could tell, you know, in the research that this is a story that that wants to be told. It, it was very unified. Once I got to the progressive era, I continued to find these interesting things um, around the social gospel movement and the opposing fundamentalist movement that arose. Um, and uh, all the way to the, you know, debates about the constitutional amendment to the Constitution in the 20s. And I um, I had no idea that um, that amendment was proposed, that it was expected to win, just like prohibition, just like women's suffrage. Everyone expected it, you know, that it would just be an easy win. And yet it was defeated. We don't even know about it because it never happened. <laughs> so right, that right. was another, you know, another big discovery for me was this uh um, constitutional amendment to um, basically regulate the, the labor of children. Um, so, I guess yeah. the whole the whole book was a was a big <laughs> a big discovery. <laughs> well, that, but you know, I have to say that's certainly how I read it. It's, it's, it was really one revelation after another. But but to return to a point you'd made just a moment ago, mm -hmm. um, I found myself to be just sort of particularly fascinated by and sort of. Um, um, just sort of deeply interested in what you paint as the uh, sort of intensely Southern roots of the anti-child labor crusade, but also um, all sort of counterintuitively, but also the heavy Southern or deep Southern roots of the movement to, uh, it, to push back against or defeat the progressive uh, pressure campaign against uh, employers who utilize Mm -hmm. child labor. So there, there's, a, there's a sort of a multifaceted, uh, the, the South is a region of, of many faces uh, in, your, in your telling. And I was, uh, I, found, I found, you know, that your book, of the many things that it did or was, uh, it was a rather compelling sort of mini biography of one figure in particular, Edgar Gardner Murphy, who um, though I teach on the subject of the child, the campaign against child labor, I never, I mean, I'm going to from this point forward, but I'd never really, I hadn't known about him, right. um, wasn't really aware of his role in um, shaping, but then also later, weirdly enough, undermining the right. campaign against <laughs> child labor. So just for those, for, I mean, because I think a lot of people might be in my position, not really knowing much about him. Could you talk a little bit about Murphy, about Edgar Gardner yeah. Murphy, and was I, was was his life and was were his exploits news to you as well? Uh, yeah, I just I, I just found him to be him. a very fascinating and strange and uh, just sort of deeply significant but relatively unknown figure in in this history. Agreed. I also did not know of Edgar Gardner Murphy. I had never heard of him um, prior to doing this research. Um, he was a minister um, from Alabama. He was a reformer, a Southern reformer. He became one of the first kind of Southern progressive reformers. And, you know, the progressive movement in the South, you know, it was um, not as developed as the Northern-based progressive movement. There were some Southern progressive reformers like Murphy that came to care about certain issues um, during the late 19th century, but they, you know, they tended to be very regional. They had a regional approach to how they wanted to solve these problems. And child labor, um, as it turns out, was a very interesting and important one of those issues. And what was so striking to me about Murphy is that, you know, he did begin um, kind of this movement to um, 
you know, regulate child labor locally, um, possibly at the state level. Um, although, you know, he didn't, um, he didn't push that too far. It was more of a local um, effort to regulate the labor of children in textile mills whenever he learned about this. And then he ended up devoting his life um, mm. to that issue. But as he became acquainted with the reformers that were in the North and he kind of started, you know, befriending them. And he even went up to New York City a few times and had dinner with them. And, you know, they together formed um, a national child labor committee. You know, he was a little uncomfortable with what some of the Northern uh, progressive reformers wanted to do. Their ambitions were larger. They wanted to have federal legislation. Um, and, you know, even, um, you know, pretty early on, there was talk of that. And Murphy made it very clear that he would only be part of this if it stayed local and if it was not part of any sort of broad federal movement, um, that this would not go over well in the South. And there was so much of this intoning of the North-South, you know, um, uh, tensions and resentment over the, you know, this had, if you think about the Civil War, in hindsight, it had not really been that long. Um, since uh, the Civil War had happened and the South was in the midst of a major kind of transition to, you know, Jim Crow segregation and, um, you know, all kinds of racist laws that were, um, you know, in the New South were becoming quickly becoming part of the culture um, and the new kind of regime, legal and political regime um, in the New South. So, you know, that's what was on Murphy's mind. And um, as soon as the broader national movement had an opportunity for regulating um, this issue on a federal level, they jumped at it. You know, they had this a senator, Albert, Albert Beveridge from Indiana, who wanted to help them out. And the Spanish-American War happened in 1898. And this seemed like a good opportunity for let's, let's get this federal legislation. Murphy left. You know, he just left the movement. And um, I found that amazing that he started it was part of it and then resigned yeah. because of the direction. He didn't like the yeah. direction that it was moving in. Um, and I think there would have been much more to his story if he had lived longer. He actually mm -hmm. passed away, um, you know, before um, a lot more happened, but he left in his wake a kind of um, divided, you know, movement that ended up becoming kind of the seeds for the counter movement. So in your, so I'm just, I'm curious then for you to talk just for a moment about then the extent to which the failure of the campaign to um, sort of enshrine um, in, in law federal protections against child labor, at least prior to the New Deal, uh, and the failure of a progressive era constitutional amendment uh, to outlaw child labor, to, in, in, your, in your telling, uh, is that, does that fail mostly because Southerners, Southern uh, sort of crusaders like Murphy are ultimately more interested in preserving Jim Crow segregation than they are in regulating child labor? Because I think right. the story is often told as one of sort of massive resistance on the part of employers, corporations, capitalists. But reading your book, um, I became sort of more convinced that it was these sort of lingering sectional tensions that were initially organized around the issue of slavery, but became more organized around the issue of sort of formal uh, segregation, uh, sort of quasi-apartheid. Uh, is that is that ultimately what happens here? In as as, as you see it, yeah, I, I I I do. I mean, I actually think it's um, I think it's both things. Um, mm -hmm. I think that um, employers and southern manufacturers, in particular. Um, who were employing children, depending on the labor of children in their um, in their factories, um, kind of saw an opportunity. Um, so it is the employers. I don't think it's an either or. Um, I think that the employers um, really saw an opportunity there to exploit I see. Um, the you know the sectional um, tensions and resentments um, and the the racism and what was happening um, in the New South with Jim Crow 
um, segregation. So um, I, I really think that, you know, it's those two things together um, can account for the failure um, of the movement to be more successful. There was so much opposition. I mean, and what, what, what kind of happened in a way is that the Southern manufacturers, um, you know, once they saw an opening to kind of create a caricature of this Northern progressive based movement to regulate child labor, you know, around the idea that this is not what you think it is. You know, this is not about protecting children in factories. Um, this is about two things. One, it's about Northern interference in the South's business and getting the government involved where, you know, it shouldn't be involved. And this is really about um, what the North has always been trying to do to interfere um, in a Southern way of life. I even found sources where they said things like one Southern manufacturer said, you know, um, the uh, Northern reformers that are pushing this are really, they're, they're being controlled by Northern capitalists that are mm -hmm. jealous of the success <laughs> of no. Southern industry. Southern industry is doing really well and they're jealous of it. And so they don't want us to succeed. And that this is um, part of a kind of um, underhanded effort to make sure that we can't be successful. Um, so that was part of it. Um, and then I think, um, you know, uh, the other, I mean, I'll, I'll stop there, but, but yeah. No, no. Think, because yeah. It, another thing that I was just sort of so fascinated to find in your book was um, the role, and Murphy himself, I believe you said, was originally a, a, a minister or a religious he, he was. authority. And he was. it seemed to me as though um, so much of the resistance um, that was sort of organized against uh, the kind of progressive crusade against child labor ultimately was organized within the confines of white churches right. in, in the South. And, and I saw sort of in, in the story you told a kind of a prelude to uh, the sort of massive resistance campaign against mm. uh, desegregation and, and the civil yes. rights movement of the 50s and 60s. I think, I think we, we get a kind of a, a glimpse or a glimmer of that in this sort of same Southern campaign against child labor laws, which are being uh, sort of railed against or invade against uh, on, you know, in, in Southern churches, on Southern pulpits. Uh, yeah. Ministers seem to play an outsized role in delegitimating uh, these, uh, these attempts to uh, limit child labor um, or regulate child labor. They, they did. And, you know, one of, one of the reasons I think that happened is because the a northern based progressive movement at the height of their success, when they actually were getting a lot of laws passed, um, even though they ended up being overturned by the Supreme Court, they were still being successful. Um, you know, they were um, really taking advantage of the social gospel movement um, and they were quoting the Bible and they were, you know, they were talking about how Jesus would have treated children and what does the New Testament say about, um, about how children should be treated. And, you know, that was, um, that was leading them to a lot of, of success and they were getting a lot of, um, you know, public support, um, and, the Northern progressive reformers would even write sermons. Um, so I'm talking about the North right now and I'll get to the South, but they were writing sermons and sending them to any progressive leaning church that was interested in supporting uh, child labor reform so that, you know, they could be part of this broader social gospel movement to, you know, protect children from exploitation and, and all of that. And it was biblical to do this. It was a, it was a Christian duty um, and they had some big people like Washington Gladden, like some big social gospel ministers that were signing on to this. And so I think that the Southern effort to stop this from happening could see that and needed a equivalent like moral um, force behind a counter movement. Mm -hmm. And it seems kind of difficult to muster up a moral you know, um, force to say that you should not 
stop children from working. Right. <laughs> like you shouldn't try to stop child exploitation. What, where is that in the Bible? And, um, and so, you know, what they did was they looked to the old Testament and they um, appealed to the idea that, you know, Genesis 3, let's see how well that I listened in Sunday school, <laughs> Genesis 3, 19, um, you know, says by the sweat of your brow, by the sweat of thy brow, that you shall earn your, um, uh, the, your bread, daily bread. And um, that this was something they could connect to the sacredness of a different kind of labor, which was farm labor, um, and that farm labor for their own children had a different value. And so just by completely shifting the debate away from, let's not talk about factories, you know, um, let's talk about a different kind of of labor, they went on the offense. And so I found like the Southern Manufacturers Association, for example, um, the there was a textile um, association. Oh, the, the National Association of Manufacturers, they were part of right. this too. Um, once they realized this, they started including like some biblical references and some, you know, uh, verses and, and sending their own materials to, um, to churches. Uh, into pastors that wanted to to be part of the counter movement um, that, you know, and they went on the offense by saying it's not about stopping what they're doing. Um, let's not talk about, you know, the factories. Let's talk about um, that we cannot allow our children to be um, taken off of their own home farms and from, from helping on their own home farms. That's what this is really about. And we need to stop these government agents from doing that. And they really went on the offense and suddenly the, the Northern um, progressive mo movement had to start producing their own literature saying, we are not trying to take children off of, you know, yeah. off of their home farms. And so once they're saying that, I mean, it was not a good position. They were not in a strong of a position anymore when they had to start responding to all of these um, offensive tactics um, right. that the manufacturers, and they were the ones behind it, but they were spurring kind of a grassroots opposition um, to the movement by that point. Yeah, I, it's, it's so shameless. Uh, I don't know why I'm ever surprised by it though. I mean, these no, were the same, same people right. who's fathers and grandfathers had opened the Bible to find justifications for slavery. And so, you know, yes. of course, they're going to be able to find similar justifications for the white slavery of the of, of the industrial age. Um, so time flies when you're having fun talking about a great book. Um, I think we've only got a couple of minutes left. Uh, so could I just have you for just to wrap things up? I mean, could you just sort of reflect for a bit on um, where well, where the book ends and maybe more significantly sort of the work that you feel is still left to be done on this subject, right. maybe what you felt you didn't have an opportunity to say much about in the book uh, for whatever reason, space, or just the fear that it would become another or a different book where you to walk down various thematic roads. Um, right. What's, what, where, where, where do you see the field going? I mean, I think your book yeah. is such a powerful and important contribution, um, but what's what's left uh, to, to right. say or what, what's left to do? And if there were people out there listening who are thinking about projects of their own on this on this particular topic, I mean, where where might you send them or what, what might you have them thinking about? Yeah, I mean, um, I think there's a lot of work left to be done. I, I do. I mean, I think one of the things I did not get to do that much of that I would love for somebody else um, to to take up would be looking at the, the voices and perspectives of the children. Like I, I had trouble like finding that in the sources, but I'm sure that it's there if you were looking for it. You know, I, I was more interested in trying to understand kind of the broader picture of these, you know, debates and kind of what I guess adults were, were thinking or saying um, about child labor, um, you know, in this period. So I'm, I'm curious if, if, you know, did actual child workers, you know, did, were they aware that this was going on? Did, you know, did a child in a 
textile mill factory? Um, did they use the argument about, um, you know, their own preciousness or their own, um, you know, uh, that they should be protected because they knew that this was happening as a way to try to to push back against their own exploitation? Like, mm -hmm. it's kind of a social history question, I guess, like a um, that getting at that perspective of of the children. And I know that you know, since we're, um, you know, doing this for SHCY, I, I think that would be a really interesting angle to try to understand how they were affected, their own perspective, um, and their experience of, of labor and of the debates that were happening in the, in the country. Um, so that would be one. And another one would, I guess, be the, the international component. I'd, I'd mm. be very curious, mm -hmm. um, you know, to see uh, someone else kind of take up the comparative uh, perspective on that, because um, I, I am making a claim about kind of sectionalism and the consequences of there being a civil war, you know, in the United States and how that affected this debate. So, so let's prove it, you know, like, let's look at some other, um, some other countries that also had child labor um, problems, um, Britain, France, Germany, you know, and they did not have internal civil wars. So, you know, did that affect um, the way that the debate played out and kind of, you know, asking comparative questions based on the conclusions of Upon the Altar of Work? Great. Yeah. So uh, for those of you listening out there, you've got your work uh, cut out for you. Um, but uh, I just, I guess I just want to end by um, thanking uh, first and foremost, uh, uh, Betsy Wood for um, writing this truly exceptional book that uh, I am actually using in my own class this semester. And it has changed the way that I am teaching the subject of uh, child labor and the campaign against child labor um, in the United States. It is a book just filled with insight and um, and um, just sort of fascinating uh, 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 bits of bits of history. Um, so, uh, just I just want to applaud you on on just just such a such a fantastic uh, such a fantastic book. Um, and oh, I really you. I urge everyone to to pick up a copy and and have their minds blown uh, as well. Uh, because well, I can't really tell lost. you what it means to hear you say that. That's you know a, a project that you know, takes this long and um, so much sweat, speaking of labor, <laughs> lots of labor, <laughs> um, you know, to uh, to hear that it's made a difference in your, your teaching and everything. Um, I really appreciate it. And this has just been a fantastic conversation and super fun. And I'm, I'm glad that you um, enjoyed the book. Absolutely. Um, so again, this comes highly recommended. Um, and I guess we both want to thank uh, everyone out there for uh, for tuning in, for for listening, and uh, and un un undoubtedly profiting from from uh, from Dr. Wood's insights. Um, so thank you, thank you again for 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 this wonderful opportunity. Thank you, Brian. I appreciate it so much. My pleasure. So long, everybody. Thank you for listening to Shusai Podcasts. You can find more materials and features from the Society for the History of Children and Youth online. shcy.org.